Right, okay. So, back, we're going to talk about a decent proposal. I'm struggling with the title for this one. But then I realised I, uh, I can make a, tie, uh, a movie tie-in. There you go. Uh, so, sadly, that's not what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, uh, instead, this is what we're going to be talking about. The, or to be precise, this. Not a quantum of solids, but a quantum of flow. What is a quantum of flow? Well, a quantum of flow is a kind of gratuitous term I made up a few weeks ago um, on the Kanban list. When people are trying to describe what is it that flows through development? What is it the, that is the piece of work that you are doing? Now, people variously describe these as work items. Sometimes people will refer to these specifically as use cases, user stories, uh, features. I've heard minimal marketable feature, MMF. There's all these kinds of debates about what it is. Um, ROI component was a term I heard. I mean, these are all very, very challenging because they, they assume that one particular decomposition. So in other words, if you are not doing development based on the kind of classic view of a user story or not doing development based on um, uh, Alistair Coburn's view of use cases or whatever, then these descriptions don't fit. And yet you can still apply many of the incremental techniques that we care about. So I just sort of jokingly made up, because I'd watched on a plane for the umpteenth time, Quantum of Solace. I said, what about Quantum of Flow? Because we already have QoS, um, quality of service, and Quantum of Solace, and all the rest of it. What about a quaff? And quaff actually, as a meaning, actually works out quite nicely. Um, because we do have this kind of idea of uh, 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 quaffing a drink. It's all about flow. It's all about taking a small gump and letting it go through the process. So. Part of this is related to my next talk, Slicing Design Over Time. But in Slicing Design Over Time, I'm going to take a much more pattern-centric view um, of this. What I'm interested in um, here, from this point of view, is this appreciation that there are two ways of looking at how a system is structured. Historically, the way this stuff has been taught, from structured design through OO design, is very much this... Um, idea of looking at the code from the point of view of modular structures, classes, packages, things like that. And then we, what we have is a description of how the system will look when it is constructed. What is perhaps missing is the fact that as you build it up, it's not going to look like that. It's going to look like a partial image. Now, what's that partial image going to look like? So if I have in some small corner of a system, I, I, I sort of sketch out an idea where I reckon I'm going to have maybe 10 classes. What is half of that code when it's working? Is it five classes? Is that the way we divide it? Often it's very difficult to just slice up something and say, oh yeah, we build this class without reference to this other class. A class is not a unit of work, or it's not a unit of developer work. It doesn't make sense from that point of view. Um, Classes don't live in isolation. What we have is this idea that sometimes you build up and you build a bit of this class and then it interacts with a bit of this class and then you build up the next slice, you slice it differently for the next feature or increment you're working on, the next quantum of flow. And the notion here is that we have these two projections. What people have emphasized in the past is the spatial structure. It's the arrangement of the classes. This is what it looks like when it's done. It's at this point. What we're missing is the animation, if you like. It's the idea that, wait a minute, maybe it changes over time. Now, I'm going to be dealing with some of that in the next talk. But it's this idea of breaking stuff down from a structural point of view, classes, and a temporal point of view, how much of a class, a portion of a class. It may be that for our 10 class model, half done is also 10 classes, but they are half full. Yeah, it's a very different slice in that sense. And this ranges from user stories to pattern stories, and pattern stories is what the next talk is going to be about. So let's focus back on this one. If we're slicing up the design and we're effectively organizing stuff, then how do we structure this? Well, one of the ways we care about this stuff is to look at priority. Priority is typically a measure of business value. And there is this idea that you slice things up and you sort of say, oh, well, this is a higher priority than this. You can use Moscow prioritization. You can use high, medium, low prioritization. You can use a, 
an absolute ordering prioritization, or you can just do a, if you have your requirements on a board, you can do position on the board. You know, the higher up it is, the more, more significant it is. You can even, if you, if you happen to have a calculator handy and you are actually a reasonable accountant, then you can even put a value on each of the um, slices and say, this means this much revenue for us or this much saving to us or whatever. But you are able to evaluate in some way. Now, um, I'm a little bit concerned that I find with some agile approaches, there's a, the idea that you don't, you somehow ignore risk or risk can always be dealt with just by doing spikes, basic prototyping. Um, risk is a, is, a, is a very challenging um, uh, uh, quantity. And in many cases, we see that the risk may be business risk, but there's also technical risk. If in order to perform a um, particular or fulfill a particular requirement that is very high priority but is also very high risk, we may choose to implement a slightly lower priority r requirement that is also lower risk, but when we complete it, it actually reduces the risk of the other requirement. Let me give you a simple example. Let's slice up the, um, uh, uh, these things. So um, imagine you're going to book a flight. Okay, you're going to book a flight on a plane, and they, uh, you want to book, uh, let me think, um, you, you can book a flight, and so therefore we sit there and we say, okay, what would you normally do? So you could book a, a round trip flight. You could book a one way flight. You could book a multi stop flight. These are the three, three of the typical options that you get. In terms of business value, a round trip flight is the one that has the greatest business value. Yeah, most people book round trip flights, return flights. Um, very, very simply, because when you go away, you want to come back. That's it. That's the standard model. Um, and only occasionally do you end up booking one-way flights. That tends to be um, more likely to be a business traveler or more likely to be somebody who is going on a tour of things. But the, the one that has the greater business value, so for, for example, a statistic I learned earlier this year is that during Chinese New Year, Chinese New Year sees the largest movement of humanity on the planet. Yeah? Uh, 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 greater than any other pilgrimage or movement of people, Chinese New Year. And guess what? They're buying return tickets. Okay? That is the major, whoop, everybody's, and it's over, and everybody comes back. Okay? That is a major migration. That has the greatest business value. One way has less business value. Multi-stop, even less business value. Let's look at that from technical complexity. The easiest one, the one that incurs, that has the least technical complexity, is a one-way flight, then a round trip, and then a multi-leg flight. If we then throw into this an additional risk, and we say, you know what, we haven't developed this kind of system before, or we haven't used that database technology before, or whatever it is, then although some agile approaches would say, oh, you know, you need to peel off the one with the highest value. Don't do that unless people actually plan to launch straight away. What you want to do is give yourself what Alistair Coburn refers to as an early victory. Choose one that de-risks, reduces the risk of the subsequent ones. It still has business value even though it's not the most important one in the system. It has overall the value to development, the ecosystem that is the developers plus the business. I dislike this strict separation between developers and business that some agile approaches seem to encourage. You work with the business, but you're not the business. I don't think that's the right message. Uh, you are the business. That's why you work with them. Um, what you do is you do something that is overall good and healthy. You do a one-way booking. That way, you have reduced the risk. You've got an early victory. You've set yourself up for the next thing. You've already got an understanding of how your team will work. You've got an understanding of how the system will work. It's got a lot of balance there. So these are matters to be juggled. Now, returning to the idea that we can slice this up. So in other words, you don't have to do a, a book a flight everything in one go. You can sub-slice it into these smaller parts. This kind of leads to the idea of a kind of an almost pointless picture approach. And indeed, this can sometimes be very challenging. Um, we subdivide and we subdivide and we end up with these small, small fragments. There's a lot of discussions about how large should a development story be? And Jeff Patton, in a rather good article, 
observed that back when XP started in on the scene and started making impressions on people, back with XP there was the idea that um, you know a story, a, u uh, a user story would be maybe five days, could be one to five days long. These days people encourage user stories to be one day long or as short as possible at that level. The same thing has happened to our perception of use cases over time. And you end up for significant systems with a fragmentation problem. We've been here before, uh, the year, uh, the years, uh, in the years of the early 1990s. One of the challenging problems perceived back then that use cases were seen to resolve is that people were focusing on scenario-based approach. A scenario is effectively a story. Um, people approached in a slightly heavyweight style, but one of the challenges people had back then, and sort of saying, well, look, you're going to run away with scenario explosion. Any trivial, any non-trivial system is going to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different individual scenarios that you can engage it in. So there is this fragmentation effect that becomes, you know, you're building out the picture from bit by bit, and you just end up with management of hundreds and hundreds of items. So you do need to watch out for the fact that if you're not careful, the um, the view that you end up with is this. As a developer, you can't tell what the big picture is. And when the people in the other part of the company or your client actually come and see what you're doing and you say what you're working on, they have no idea what you're talking about. Even though it's in business language, they have no idea because it's split so finely. Now, th one of the interesting observations here is that all of these approaches, use cases, user stories, user story maps, that's another Jeff Pat one, FDD features, all of these have the same underlying thing. Um, and indeed, uh, what's funny is the way that uh, use cases are being reinvented by people doing user stories. We now have epics and themes. We now have user story maps. All of this stuff was known a number of years ago, although presented sometimes slightly differently. What all these things have is that they are structured in terms of goals. The most effective ones are structured in terms of goals. By goal, I mean that you're looking to slice things up and the goal of a functionally complete slice is to achieve something, to book a one-way flight. That is a goal. It's not called booking, it's to book a one-way flight. You, you, you organize booking a one-way flight is um, at that level. But we can recursively apply this. So at the top level we have a broad use case, book flight. Then you subdivide that, book a one-way flight, book a round-trip flight, book a multi-leg flight. You can, uh, you can uh, break it down along other axes. In fact, um, Alistair Coburn went along uh, uh, far enough to say that use cases form a recursive algebra, for those of you that care. Yeah? So they, they can be recursively split down and down and down, each slice getting thinner and thinner and thinner, corresponding to a very specific situation. This is, at this point you realize there isn't actually a lot of, there's a, the differences between use cases and user stories are minor matters of ideology. The principles are the same. They are open to slicing and uh, breaking these things up. But what is sometimes missing is this idea that there is a structure to how we do the slice. There is the difference between a good slice and a poor slice. The thing that you need is a stated goal. Book a flight. Book a one-way flight. Something very specific to that. Book a one-way flight with a credit card. Book a one-way flight with a debit card very, very specific. You can see how you can end up with this kind of pointillist explosion. But in working, many of these things are not really for the benefit. They cease to be of benefit to the, um, uh, uh, the kind of the stakeholders. They start focusing on the development team. The idea there is that with that goal, you should be able to state a post condition. What happens when you achieve this? What happens if we are successful in booking a one-way flight. What, in what way would the system change that we can verify? What propositional statement can I offer? What post-condition can I define this in terms of? Um, and it's, uh, you know, this is actually a skill in terms of teasing this out. And this is the bit that I'm interested in. This is where the decent proposal comes in. You need a decent proposition. Because a lot of people will do something along the lines of, okay, book a flight. Post condition, flight is booked. That's most of the use cases I ever see. And somebody might come along and say, oh, yeah, but you using BDD. BDD has gone and reinvented the post condition concept. It just uses better language. Exactly the same problem can occur unless the author is in the right frame of mind. Post condition. It's not the flight or a flight is booked. The flight that is specified. 
for the dates at the time with the flight code is booked in the person's name with respect to the debit card which has been debited this amount we can verify that and they have this following confirmation code which is unique in the current set of active confirmation codes that's a much more precise post condition still a post condition but now the difference between that one and this one is that it is testable it is precise it is testable you can actually write code against this I know how to write code against that I know how to write a test against that it allows me a, a well-defined completion status, a definition of done. Now, it's one of those things, you know, book a flight, post condition, customer walks away happy. Okay, tell me how to test happiness. Okay, I get all this kind of stuff where people say, oh, you know, yeah, and, and it was booked and the customer is happy. You can't verify that in, that in that way. You're looking for something concrete and precise. It is also not enough that sometimes when we talk about user stories, the classic quote on user stories is a user story the irony of a user story uh, approach is the user story has no story. It's just basically a description of, it's, <laughs> it's the story without the story. It's a description, it's a promise of a conversation. Most people's conversational skills aren't up to this kind of precision. So it's good to have a conversation, it is good to talk. But what we need ultimately is in some way to express a clear proposition, whether that comes through writing on a piece of card or writing something in a testable format on a screen, something that we can verify. We would choose a concrete example. I'll talk about the example-based aspect um, later, because I've just given you a generality for a given flight with respect to a debit card, etc., etc., some confirmation code that is unique, and so on. What you might want to look for is something specific. Give me a concrete example. Okay, um, London Heathrow to Oslo. Okay, that's concrete. What? When? Thursday. Okay, the 12.45 flight. So this is my flight. And for this number, and so on and so on. That's a concrete example. For whom? For Kevlin Henney. Okay, and what, de and what credit card was that on? Well, I'm not going to tell you that bit. Oh, actually, no, I can, because it's due to expire in about a week and a half. So that's all right. Um, uh, besides which, if you do try and use my credit card, my... my uh, credit card companies got recently very zealous. They sort of said, oh yes, but you're in a different country. Yes, I normally am. You're trying to use your credit card. Yes, I know. That's why you're ringing me. It's me. Yeah. The best conversation I ever had on this line was um, when I was in, uh, um, you know, I've had to tell them, look, anywhere, every year I have to tell them. They normally stop me. I'm in Europe. It's okay. That's where I normally travel within Europe. But I had a good one in February. I was in Bangalore. And uh, I suddenly realized I needed to get some cash out. And the, only, the hotel didn't have the cash, so the only way I could do it was to find a cash machine. I was given directions to find cash machines. And I went and tried all these cash machines, got rejected, got rejected, got rejected, and my phone is going. Hello? Hello, this is your bank. Who are we speaking to? Uh, Kevin Henney, yeah. It's your bank. All right, okay. Um, we've just had some tra somebody trying to make transactions on your card. Um, precisely where in the world are you, Mr. Henney? Um, Bangalore. I'm in India. No, sorry, I said, I'm in India. Whereabouts? Bangalore. Um, whereabouts? Uh, Koramangala. Whereabouts? Oh, the main street. Oh, we're about four miles away from you. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd rung a UK number to have it transferred all the way back to India. We had a great conversation, you know. It's just like, oh, yeah, so you here long? No, I need to get the money to get myself to the airport tomorrow morning. I should only be in Bangalore for another, f you know, seven hours. All right, you enjoyed your stay? Hey, yeah, yeah, some really good stuff. Yeah, did you go see some of the temples? Yeah. Great conversation. I think that got me through the queue a lot quicker. But, you know, um, these things do end up. But there's a concrete example. So, in other words, for this scenario, I give you a concrete example. I don't just talk in generalities. I'm able to give you, okay, here's the general thing about booking a flight. But the specifics, let me give you a specific example. You can nod your head out and say, yeah, I understand. Okay, that for this bank charge, for this much, and so on, then we will get this outcome, and it is verifiable in testable format, and very easily so. You may also offer a softer objective, something that is not quite as precise, um, a, a business goal. So, for example, one of the uh, challenges that people often encounter is uh, the use case doesn't necessarily tell you why the use case is being done. It tells you that it is being done. The user story follows the same role, but actually within the style of user stories these days, there is a common uh, approach. Um, the, uh, the ritual is kind of like, as a something, as a customer, um, 
I would like to do whatever, so that, whatever, and there's another style that I've seen, in order to do whatever as a customer, I would like to do this. So in other words, you justify that, so that, or in order to, is normally to state a business objective, in order to improve revenue, or in order to improve security, in order to do this, uh, in order to provide compatibility for customers, in order to entice customers over from this other system, or whatever. The idea is that you, provide, you can provide a softer justification. It's, slightly l it's a broader goal, not something that can be easily verified, uh, but nonetheless it has a place. So we find these ideas recurring across all of these techniques. And what every single one of them has is a relationship to testability or verifiability. And what I'm interested in here is that we can do this when we think about requirements of a system. How would I test this? How would I demonstrate that this is the case? I can't demonstrate that the customer is happy. But what I can do is I can create a situation in which subsequent measures can tell us about how many customers we have or what the general level of feedback is or whatever. Uh, what would those be? And it, uh, go through things that are genuinely concrete. Try and find out the boundary between what we know and what we don't know and what we can say with certainty. But by looking at these things from a point of view of testability, so for example, when people sort of talk about, um, people often say, oh, well, this only applies to functional requirements. What about operational requirements like performance or availability? Similar reasoning applies, and here actually it can actually be very helpful when people talk about this kind of stuff, is you're expecting variability. It can be quite difficult to measure sometimes. Um, variability, for example, uh, when people sort of say, oh, you know, we have a requirement. What, is, what requirements have you got? Availability. We need five nines availability. Yeah, it's very fashionable to say things like that. Five nines availability. That means that your downtime per year is going to be less than five minutes, I think it is. That's quite impressive. If you're talking six nines availability, you're talking about less than half a minute. Some telecom systems are supposed to run at that. Now, my question to you is, how are you going to test that? I mean, it's all very well saying, you know, it's this is very political. You know, it's like politicians say, oh, we're going to change the economy. Yeah, I bet you will. But probably not the way you anticipated. Yeah? How can you say that with confidence? It's these, um, these various um, consultants' reports that you get you know, uh, that predict that in five years' time, the market for, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, telephony-based applications that you can put on your glasses will be you know, N billion dollars or something like that. How do they know? They don't. They're just guessing. But they couch it in terms that make it look plausible. When people say, well, our system has five nines availability, the question is, how many years do you have to run it for before you can actually say that confidently? What would you test for to demonstrate that it had five nines reliability? You can't, at least not for a decade. You can't collect sufficient data in a shorter period of time. In fact, the worst thing is you can only collect data that contradicts it. You know, I can't remember what is it, uh, the, uh, the, the major telephone network hiccup they had in North America in the early 90s uh, because somebody missed a break from a switch statement. Seriously, cost, uh, it wiped out the telephone network for five hours for 150 million people, and that included uh, New York and Washington. That costs a lot of money. Now, that's a missing break statement. So for those of you who work in C-sharp and you ever wondered why you can't fall through a case statement, that's why. Uh, yeah. Microsoft is not going to have this one pinned on them. Um, this was a case of eat your own dog food, because you know, C originated at AT&T, and it was AT&T's system. Now, in that five hours, I don't know what, system, what the availability of that system was. I don't know if it was supposed to be five nines or six nines, but basically they blew their budget for the next few centuries. Okay, So it's difficult to demonstrate this stuff. So what we're doing with this kind of testability view is we are saying... We need to make a proposal about a requirement that is in some way verifiable. But we're going to look at this from another point of view, because we're looking at this from external requirements. I want to turn this one around and say, actually, when we write other kinds of tests, we can use the requirements style as well. So this also applies to unit tests. So here's a nice little quote from Alistair Coburn. And it it reflects a common problem of uh, uh, what I think Martin Fowler referred to as semantic diffusion. That sometimes when a word becomes popular, it just becomes, it becomes a little more general. It diffuses. Its meaning becomes diluted. 
Everybody wants to use the word. People use the word refactoring to mean any kind of change. People use the word TDD to mean somebody somewhere is testing. Yeah? Very many people will say TDD when they really mean, I have good unit tests. I have guts. Ron Jeffries tried for years to explain what this was, but we never got a catchphrase for it. And now TDD is being watered down to mean guts. Well, I've written a series of articles recently where I've actually taken Alistair's um, guts, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, I've taken Alistair's guts, um, and I've focused on uh, exactly that. Let's understand that what we mean is good unit tests. Then let us differentiate the ways in which we can achieve good unit tests. What differentiates a good one from a poor one? Yeah. So how to get guts, or how to get Alistair's guts? Um, I always used to teach TDD in terms of three different styles. Or rather, I used to teach unit testing in terms of three different styles. Passive, active, and reactive. But now we have terms for all of them. Um, passive, th plain old unit testing. I'll talk about the genesis of that in a moment. Test-driven development, the one that everybody wants to aspire to. But sometimes people find it impractical. Sometimes it doesn't sit with their style. Sometimes whatever the reason is, the point there is this is the more classic approach uh, is, is pouting, but TDD is an active approach, passive approach. By passive, I mean that you have written the code, and now you're going to write code that exercises it. You're going to write tests that exercise the code. It's passive in the sense of you're not looking to change the code that you have written, except maybe to fix stuff. You're using it really to flush out the idea of, well, does it do the right thing? Is it broken? You're looking to demonstrate that it's not broken. Active means that you're actually using TDD to formulate what you mean by what the code does. You're actually using TDD to define what the code does. You're saying, with this test, I will tell you what the requirement for this piece of code is. And when I use the word requirement, I'm using it in that kind of recursive sense that you have requirements from the outside of the system. Those are the external, actual uh, stakeholder, end user, whatever requirements. Then when this piece of code calls this piece of code, it has a requirement an expectation of what that code is going to do. It's going to assert a need over it. I'm talking about code-to-code -code requirements there. These are constructed requirements, requirements that we make of our own design. Then we have reactive, defect-driven testing. You have a bug, you write a test. You have another bug, you write another test. Now, I always use the defects to drive it. Now, typically, people offer a focus on a blend of these things. Um, I guess probably the most common blend is passive plus reactive. Um, but uh, in many cases, if I'm messing about with a little piece of code, it'll be passive, active, reactive. Um, you know, it'll be a, a blend of those. Um, but what you tend to notice is less reactive. Just as a general point, Ma Michael Feathers read a rather good blog last year, this time last year, on the fallacy of unit testing, the idea that it's all about just finding defects. That's a, that's a fallacious assumption, and that there are reasons to understand why that's wrong. But that's not where I'm going. This is where I'm going. Jacob Prophet beginning of last year, did this rather nice little blog. He favours pouting. Okay, fine. It's a lifestyle choice. But what I liked was the fact that he, uh, uh, he focused on this. Because unit testing is the plain Jane progenitor of test-driven development, it's kind of unfair that it doesn't have an acronym of its own. After all, it's hard to get programmer types to pay attention if they don't have some obscure jargon to bandy about. Yeah, we need jargon. It's no use just calling that plain unit testing. That's not very exciting. So borrowing from what the telco folks do, because they talk about plain old telephony systems as opposed to, say, um, uh, more modern systems, plain old telephony systems are POTS, P-O-T-S's. Um, and we find this recurrent in things like POJOs, that name, naming pattern, that snow clone kind of follows through. Um, so plain old unit testing, which happens to be pronounceable, pout or pouting. Um, well, I, th I think it's a rather nice way of looking at it. So uh, uh, yeah, you do pout or TDD. Um, but let's go back to TDD, because with pouting, we can get the good unit test that we want. But I really want to draw this one out as a, an engagement, a pull-based approach that is definitional. I think TDD is better at getting you to define your code in terms of those requirements. Um, once you are comfortable with this style, it tends to be easier to see your way around other styles. But the idea here, everybody knows that TDD stands for test-driven development. Well, actually, you know what? That's not true. Um, in North America, TDD also stands for Telephony Device for the Deaf. So I was very surprised at an airport many years ago when I saw a telephone with TDD on it. 
And I thought, wow, that's quite an impressive claim. Yeah. Um, but it was just dial first, not test first. TDD, I had a conversation with somebody two years ago on this one, and he sort of paused me part way through. He said, TDD, I'm not getting what you're saying, Kevin. TDD, top down design, yeah? No, 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 no. Test driven. Oh, okay. Because he said, yeah, what you were saying didn't make sense. Good. <laughs> Speak to my wife. She says the same thing. But test driven development is the one that we're looking at. However, people too often concentrate on the words test and development and don't consider what the word driven really implies. For tests to drive development, they must do more than just test that code performs its required functionality. They must clearly express that required functionality to the reader. That is, they must be clear specifications of the required functionality. This is really key. This is a very different idea. It's a specification. This is one of the things that when I ask people about why they are testing, why are you unit testing? And sometimes people say, oh, I thought you were in favor of unit testing. I thought you'd be pleased that we're testing. Well, I might be pleased, but why do you think you're testing? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you whether or not I'm pleased in a minute. Well, I'm testing to find out if the code does the right thing. Ah, what is the right thing? At this point, well, you know, that it's not broken. Well, what does not broken mean? Well, that it's working. What, that it does the right thing? Yes. Well, what was that right thing? Ah. The point here is that actually when people say we're testing that the code does the right thing, you haven't answered the question. All you've done is raised another question. You, wh where is the right thing defined? In what way do we know the right thing when we see it? And the notion here is that perhaps the test can be one of the things that helps us understand what the right thing is. It is definitional. It's not merely executional. Oh, check the code is the right thing. No, the test actually sets the expectation. Tests that are not written with their role of specifications in mind can be very confusing to read. The difficulty in understanding what they are testing can greatly reduce the velocity at which a code base can be changed. In other words, this gives you feedback on the quality of the design, the changeability, and the, uh, uh, the, the degree of coupling in the system and the qualities of cohesion that you have in your code. Now, what's interesting is this was taken, um, this quote is taken from um, a, uh, a session that um, Nat and Steve ran at XP, XP Day 2007 uh, in London. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't attend because I think this would have been fascinating because what they did is they wrote this, uh, what they did is they gave uh, pairs of programmers, something like this, they gave pairs of programmers little problem descriptions. You know, I guess probably defined on a card, give them a little problem description. And say, so, right, okay, write code and tests for this problem. They go ahead, they write code and tests. You know, it'd be a small problem of some kind. And then what they would do is get people to pass the code to other people, but only the code. They wouldn't pass the tests, or no, sorry, let me rewind, play. They would get people to pass the tests to other people. They wouldn't pass the code and they wouldn't pass the problem description. You only give somebody else the tests and then you say, implement that. That's very interesting. So, given just the tests, is that sufficient specification to write it? Well, the way most people write tests, no, it isn't, unfortunately, because we haven't been thinking in those terms. The tests are merely there to check that it doesn't fall over. They don't actually demonstrate what the functionality is. Um, and one of the most interesting things uh, to do when you're, uh, when, you, when you're looking at somebody writing tests or writing code, if you're sort of saying, okay, the goal is to try and get to define your code's behavior. See how much of the code you can actually delete before a test fails. It turns out to be quite a lot. And I'm not talking coverage statistics. Coverage statistics can be very misleading here. This is not about coverage statistics. This is about have you justified the code that you have? Have you defined it clearly enough? Do you have a decent proposal for what it should do? So let's start off with where many people begin their testing adventures. And indeed, some people linger there. I know some very experienced programmers who still write tests in a, that do write tests. Well, I know some very experienced writers that don't write tests. I know some very experienced programmers that do write tests in one of these styles, monolithic or ad hoc. Um, and the, a monolithic test tends to be just a, a stream of stuff. You just write a big slab of thing, and it's probably called test. This can be very useful if you're just exercising a very small piece of code. I mean, really, a very small piece of code. If you're experimenting with something, that, that can be fine. Um, but possibly worse than this is the ad hoc approach. So let me pick on 
the um, uh, an example that I, I tend to use for this one. That's a monolithic test. This is using n unit. Um, it's a test on a recently used list, a, a rather good teaching example. A recently used list is a list that holds strings and it holds them in insertion, reverse insertion order. You you insert something into it, it goes to the head. Um, so it retains it in that order, but it's not a completely a stack because when you reinsert an item already in there, it goes to the head, but you don't get a duplicate. So there's a very key behavior there. So it's like a recently opened file list. So here we can see the code is being tested, but it's all a bit of a slab of code. It's not very clear what's going on. We, we're sort of doing stuff. It's not clear what this, what's going on with this. This one I love. This is actually, this is based on um, a, a client of mine. No, they weren't writing recently used lists. This is actually something else they were writing. But sometimes people say, well, you need to break that up. Right, it's not enough to tell somebody that they need to break something up. Otherwise, they will ingeniously work around what you've told them or misinterpret what you've told them. How might I misinterpret this? Yeah, we broke it up into three. Yeah, there you go, test one, test two, test three. Yeah, it's broken up. Right, so is my understanding. I have even less chance of understanding this now than before. One of my clients presented me with their code that did this and, uh, and said, so could you give us some feedback on our tests? I said, okay, your naming convention. Oh, okay. Test one. What does this do? Oh, let's have a look. We looked at it for a while. Oh, this test, that this, that, that, the other. Oh, okay, right. So let's call that test after what you've just told me. Okay. Test two, what does this do? Uh, I don't think that technique you're mentioning is going to work. Why not? Well, it's testing two different things. What? Two completely different things? Yes, completely different, unrelated. This test is in two halves. Yeah? Uh, and the second half doesn't use any of the variables from the first half. Right. So where I come from, that's called two tests. <gasps> oh, okay. And it's not test 2A, test 2B. Just to be clear about that. And then the, but the one that will live with me forever is test 3. Oh, yeah. This approach of naming of yours, Kevin, is not going to work here. Why not? We don't know what it does. <laughs> In what way is that my problem? You don't know what it does. So when it fails, you don't, you don't know what it is that you're running. So when it passes, you don't know what passes. When it fails, you don't know what failed. And you don't know how to fix it. Whew, that's pretty tough. Maybe you're better off deleting the test and starting again. So. People move on from this kind of approach to writing tests. And the next most common approach, no, in fact, no, I would say this is probably more common than the previous two, is the most common approach, because it's also reinforced by wizards or sorcerers' apprentices, and is to say, I have some function foo, and I'm going to test it. And my test function will be called test foo. And this is the stuff that wizards do. This is the most common. It is popular. It is widely used. It is supported by tools. It is also wrong. Okay. So in what way is that wrong? Let's look at this. So we test the constructor. We test the add method. We test the indexer. Right. So that gives, that gives us these features, constructor, add, indexer. Right. So in what way? Let's have a look here. So wait a minute. We test the constructor, fine. We test the add method. Mm, we didn't really test the add method. We, keep add, we add one, we check the count. We add another, we check the count. We add another, we check the count. Then we actually check that you can index the things correctly. So actually, most of add's behavior is being tested in the indexer method. But because we were pretending we didn't have an indexer method here, we couldn't say that. So if you want to understand how add works, you need to look at indexer. The point here is that the procedural decomposition of the tests doesn't describe how this works at all. It completely is at odds with the way that you'd use this. And notice, even in trying to test the constructor, you can't test the constructor unless you call count. But we don't call this one test count. You can't write a test count method that doesn't involve a constructor. And you can't write a test constructor method that doesn't involve the count, because you want to state something useful about it. So here, this. This just does not work. As a naming convention, it simply does not work. There is, you can try and justify it, but it doesn't work. There is no way you can apply this one consistently. So let's try and do something a little more um, reasonable, uh, which is to go forward rather than backwards. Thank you. Let's try this one. So here are the tests. I'm not interested in the body. I'm interested in the names. If you take the name up here 
And then you put some spacing in and do whatever. In fact, I've actually started encouraging people to use underscores in the names because multi-capitalization just doesn't work. It is, I hate to say it, although this is one of the most popular naming conventions around, it's actually a dumb idea. It doesn't scale beyond about 15 characters. Human visual perception is not comfortable with it. Um, so I've encouraged people to at least start writing their tests using ordinary English sentences um, and English case uh, and then put underscores in it, otherwise you're just not going to read it. Now, if we look through the names, initial list is empty. Addition of single item to empty list is retained. Addition of distinct items is retained in stack order. Duplicate items are moved to the front but not added. Out of range index throws exception. We can write some others, but the key thing here is that every single test name states a proposition about the behavior. It proposes what is going to happen. When you see this come up in an execution list, you can tell what the class does, or you can tell what the slice of code you're looking at does. It's very easy, and when you see a test that fails, it's really easy to know what failed. Let's just say duplicate items are moved to front but not added, and that fails. Well, obviously, duplicate items aren't being moved to the front or are not being added. You know, they are being added. You, you can tell what is wrong. You may not know why it is wrong, but you know what is wrong. With the way most people partition their tests, you can't tell what's wrong or why. You just know that something somewhere is not working. And it's normally not the method that's stated. What is interesting about this naming convention is to carry on a point from the previous talk. The naming changes the way you actually perceive the code. It's not merely labeling the code. This is not just about naming conventions to make your code pretty. This is actually changing the partitioning. Notice the difference in the partitioning between that and that. Yeah? The partitioning difference here is quite fundamentally different to the partitioning here. The names actually suggest something fundamentally different in terms of how it works. So what we're seeing is something quite, um, uh, quite different. We're seeing somebody trying to write their code in terms of the propositions, the requirements about what the code is supposed to do. Now this insight was originally, um, I originally got this insight a couple of years ago, it was actually, uh, when was it, about th three years ago? Um, two and a half, three years ago, watching Dan North give a talk on behavior-driven development. I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Because there's this kind of progression that my code went through um, in terms of testing. I started off procedural testing. I realized it, it felt uncomfortable, didn't handle the edge cases well. It means you tend to miss the edge cases because you try and pile them all into one because your method has lots of edge cases. In other words, this method is about add, this method is about add, this method is about add, and oh, this one isn't for a change. They are all about indexing or add in some way. These, all, these four involve indexing. And if we write a few more, we see that they cut across, they slice across the interface of this class. And so what we're doing here is by changing the naming convention, we actually change the style of partitioning. It has an architectural influence with respect to the tests. Um, this is what we mean by good unit tests. So let me pick on another example that uh, I'm kind of intrigued by. I've been using this example as a teaching example for many years because superficially it looks easy. But most people don't get the code right and they certainly struggle with the tests. And I think the struggle is a useful one because it indicates an issue of essential complexity. The rule for a leap year is actually quite subtle. And it's not because the code is subtle. There's no way you can arrange the code to make this look simple. Try it. It's a good exercise. You can put it on as many lines or as few lines as you want, and in no case will it ever look simpler. Well, there are a couple of techniques you can use, but I'm not here to explore that. I want to explore how you define it. So I've got a method here. Is leap year? I want to classify whether or not a year is a leap year, has 366 days, or whether it is not a leap year, false, has 365 days. So here's my procedural approach. Test is leap year. OK, that just tells me I'm testing is leap year. So here's a non-object oriented example. And we're going to see that this doesn't work with the procedural style either. Test is leap year. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't tell me anything about what a leap year is. It doesn't test tell me anything about the typical conditions. When this fails, I have no idea what failed and why. It does not help define and help me understand what the leap year rule is. OK, let's try this one. Here, we're going to partition with respect to the result set. The result set, there are two possible results. Let's partition with respect to them. There are leap years and there are non-leap years. Okay, so we can do that. 
this is better in the sense that we've classified things at one level, but still, it turns out that's not enough to tell you what the real rule is for leap years. Let's try this differently. Years not divisible by four are not leap years. Yeah, that's true. 2009, that's not a leap year. 2007, that's not a leap year either. 2002, yeah, that's not a leap year. Okay, years not divisible by four are not leap years. Good. Years divisible by four but not by 100 are leap years. Yeah, 2008 was a leap year. That's true, 2004, 1996. Yeah, yeah those, those are definitely leap years. Okay, good. Years divisible by 100 but not by 400 are not leap years. Yeah, 1900 wasn't a leap year, and neither will 2100 be. And years divisible by 400 are leap years. Yeah, 2000 was, wasn't it? So here what I've done is I've illustrated this rule. That in implementation, it only takes one line of code to implement the logic. And it's, this is excessive, four tests. No, no, no. The four tests are here. It's not about the number of lines of code. It's not about the number of methods that you write. It is about the literacy of the methods. Have you made the proposition clear? The reason people struggle with leap year rule is because they are human. Even programmers are human, and they still struggle with it. So what is the challenge here? Humans can normally work effectively with one level of rule. We can work reasonably effectively with a rule that has an exception. Yeah? So, I don't know, English spelling. Oh, I love English spelling. It's great. It's how people get lost. You know, it's just a mess. Um, so, English spelling. I before E, except after C. Yeah, I, I think even my seven-year-old now knows that rule. I before E, except after C. So there's the rule, I before E. There's the exception, except after C. The problem is, there's exceptions to that rule as well. Oh, and there's exceptions to those. We're not very good when we get beyond one level of exception. The reason people are struggle with the leap year rule is because it has three levels of exception to it. It's nothing to do with the complexity of the code. It is to do with the complexity of the rule. The only way to change this rule is to get a time machine and go back 400 or so years and have a little word with Pope Gregory. But I think that might be a little bit beyond. I'd suggest changing your test style before you do that. Okay. The point here is that this is a reflection of the essential complexity of the underlying rule. This is nothing about code. This is actually revealing what the rule is. Now, if one of those tests fails, you know exactly what went on. Also notice that I've abandoned the use of the word test in the test names here. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. Because here I've used it as propositions. This is a proposition. It's a statement. Years not divisible by four are not leap years. That's a plain statement of fact. So we have a style that is highlights expressiveness. If we look a little bit further, here is the style that many people find themselves caught in between. This is the style I was at before I saw Dan give his talk, where it was basically I suddenly realized what I've been missing is the conclusion. It's like a joke without a punchline. What we have is once you go beyond procedural, you start saying, well, look, let's test it in this situation. Let's test it in this situation. Let's test it in this situation. Let's test years not divisible by four. Good. Let's test years not div uh, that are divisible by four. Test years divisible by 100, but not by 400, and so on and so on. We go through and we test each one individually. Actually, that second one's wrong. Um, we go through and we test each one individually, but we don't tell you what we were expecting. So when that fails, when one of those fails, I don't know what was testing. I know what I was testing, but I don't know what the proposition was. Did we expect it to be false or true? So the idea is that in, you don't simply tell the basic part of the joke. You tell the punchline as well. You say, here is the proposition. This is this case. You do this, you get this. Here is the rule, the proposal that we are making about this slice of behavior. Um, one of the practices that you find in BDD, Behavior Driven Development, is there's a lot of um, focus on the use of the word should. Who, who's come across the, this idea of using the word should in the name? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. Um, I think that if it helps you, then do it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't find it a useful thing. Um, it's a ritual word. Sometimes people like ritual words that help them put them in the right frame of mind. But for me, um, should in English is a, it's a suggestion. It's a recommendation, but it's not a requirement. You know, it's, um, when you use should, 
there's an implication that maybe it's okay if it isn't or you're expecting it not to. Years not divisible by four should not be leap years, but they might be. The keys should be on the table, but they might not be. You know, the point there is should is kind of like it makes the author of the code look like they don't know what they're talking about. But if it helps you come up with these names, I'm happy. Um, now, sometimes you need to work with uh, frameworks that require you to put a prefix like test, so JUnit3, a classic example. In other cases, you may prefer that style. You may feel comfortable with it, or your team may have that style. Oh, yeah, we always prefix our code with test, our test cases with test. I'm going to uh, uh, just make one simple plea. Don't just use test. Use test that. If you have to write test, I urge you to, s using the characters you saved by not writing should, write that. Because there's a difference because of the phrasing. Test that can only be followed by essentially what is a full sentence. You can only follow it by a full statement of fact. You can test constructor, but you can't test that constructor. What, that one there? No, that one there. You have to test that construction results in empty list. You have to test that something is the case. The very wording forces you into a different grammar. Test that year is not divisible by four and not leap years. So that shifts it. Um, I sometimes also teach require that to really get people away from the test vocabulary. So I think the thing that Dan definitely got right is changing the words really does make a big difference. Um, but actually, it's not just the words. You need to change the grammar. Words are not everything. Grammar is where most of the meaning is conveyed, positioning and emphasis. So what we are actually doing here is outlining a contract for our code. We are binding our code with a contract. It is an agreement. There are many different kinds of agreement. Your contract for a piece of code may be formalized. It may be written in a document. Your contract may be written in terms of pre and post conditions. Your contract may be written in terms of tests. Your contract may merely be verbal. You were in the pub with a friend, you were in the pub with a work colleague, and your work colleague said, you know what, I really need a method that does this on that class. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, okay, I'll do that when I get back to the office tomorrow. Right, that's your contract. Yeah, It's not particularly strong, and it might be quite difficult to enforce, particularly if you have a lot to drink. Um, but that is the contract. Contracts exist at different degrees of formality. So there's a metaphor here that we can use. is that of client and supplier. Now, sometimes when people hear contract metaphor, they think, oh, contracts. Oh, right, yeah, that's programmed by contract. No, no, no. Programmed by contract is a very specific application of the contract metaphor. It's basically focused on the idea of writing pre and post conditions. And the notion here is, when I look at this piece of code here, no, 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 it is leap year. There's the result. You figure out the result. This is the code you've got to implement. And then you assert some result. Uh, you assert that something must necessarily be true. And then you return. That's the post condition approach um, uh, or the post condition aspect of this. Um, I've been looking at desi uh, design by contract or program by contract, uh, just as a, a minor note. Um, design by contract is trademarked. So you'll find a lot of people these days talk about programming by contract because that's not trademarked. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure how useful it was to trademark it. Uh, it's also one of the reasons that I tended to use the f uh, term contract metaphor. This contract idea is not just about post conditions. A contract is an agreement. It's an arrangement. A test is an arrangement. A test tells you stuff. So those tests for, um, uh, those tests for the recently used list, um, for leap year logic, those define things. They tell you what you are expecting, and they tell you what you are entitled to if you use that code. They are a contractual arrangement. It turns out they're also much more likely to be correct. OK, so <laughs> I want to show you why it is that programming by contract doesn't work in a larger number of cases than testing by contract does. How confident are you that that's correct? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let, let me actually let's put that. You've just raised the point there. Exactly. How confident are you that when I put the implementation of the code in, that the assertion will always succeed? Very. Why are you so confident? Because it's going to be the same thing. Of course it is. Because <laughs> that is the definition of the logic. 
So now what you're going to do is you're going to end up with this problem. If this is a very, very true for many things that are transformational and, and, and functional. You're going to end up with this classic problem of copy and paste. Either you will copy the implementation to be the thing you, uh, you uh, do a check on, or you will copy the spec to be the implementation. Hmm. Yeah. So if you were looking to avoid defects, don't use this technique for certain approaches. It, can st it has applicability. I think it's very useful to be able to formulate a post condition. But what I've discovered in a number of years trying to convince people to write post conditions, I found it that people are actually better at being able to write test cases than they are about post conditions. I don't want to say that they exact cover the same space. Um, there are a number of cases that program by contract doesn't cover. It doesn't cover interaction behavior based code particularly well. It doesn't co cover code that where you deal with lots of state transitions. It doesn't work particularly well. The benefits are not realized for a number of uh, uh, bits of code like this. If you're working in a functional programming language, half the time the implementation is going to be exactly the same as the assertion. So you need a different frame of thinking. And that is where that notion where I started off with earlier of having a concrete example. You want a definition of the proposal. Years not divisible by four are not leap years. Good. Now, give me an example that demonstrates, uh, demonstrates something about that, and we'll work to that. That keeps you free from making the same mistakes as you would make in the implementation. This, you are likely to end up, uh, all my years, whenever I've seen people using assertions, and in fact, I abandoned using assertions after a while, um, uh, in the classic program by contract approach because I found most people are incapable of doing it correctly. So, concrete examples. People work well with examples. People are naturally example driven. They like examples. They doesn't mean they can't do theoretical and abstract thinking. They can, but in many cases they can't push that to the limit that we would like for the precision that we are after. And that is, that is a problem because we end up with this kind of copy and paste or people only, they don't see a benefit to it. Um, there is a, an interesting consequence of um, example-based uh, test cases, which is to do with the readability uh, or the compaction of the code. An important point here is that if you look here, um, I'm going to ask you to tell me, th this, is a, this is a simple worked example, a fragment of a, 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 a little, um, little application. Um, which is the test code and which is the production code because obviously you can read it all test code on the left you have good eyesight all right so how how do you how do you how do you say that why do you say that because yes that is correct they just look more like test cases exactly they have a particular anatomy they have a particular profile just as when you sometimes when you look at um, you, you get these wonderful um, uh, images um, airplanes flying over um, uh, fields and uh, and from an altitude you can sometimes see the lines of fields or old roads as they were a thousand years ago even though at the ground level you couldn't see anything that was different you go up and you suddenly see something I stumbled across this technique by accident with a piece of code many years ago um, which there was some 1500 line method and I was going through it was very very heavily indented and actually you could be scrolling down the screen and you come across a blank screen because it had gone off the screen you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, this is exciting space, but no, actually, we're in the middle. You look at the code, the, uh, this is not the code you're looking for, it's over here. Yeah. So I, I changed the font size, and suddenly it was kind of like seeing this kind of like huge aerial view of the code. It's fantastic. And interesting enough, yeah, this stuff is simply based on examples, 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 examples. Actually, the reason the test code is shorter, you get very good coverage with this, is because there is a helper method here that does most of the work, and that is used here. So you can compact the test cases. Take that help method away, and this goes through the floor. Here is the logic. Now, you can see that the actual production code differentiates itself. This is a table registration. This is a main loop. This is a helper of the main loop. This is some other handler. I can't remember what now. And this is some other private helper. And so you have here a high degree of differentiation and variability in the code style. There's indentation, there is logic. With an example-based test case, you use something that is so very different. It is based on concrete examples, actual values. This leads to that, leads to that, leads to that. You end up with a very different style. You look at your code from a different point of view, from the point of view of usage, genuinely a separation, rather than the point of view of functional internal logic. 
um, which answers, helps us answer the question, how do I know that my tests do not have bugs? That question now changes. How do I know that my requirements are, inc are correct at this level? How do I know that I am requiring the right thing of this class? Well, the point is you're trying to use it. That is how you know. You are not focused on the mechanism. You have concrete examples so you don't have to duplicate implementation externally. And so therefore, the errors that you've got will be the classic copy and paste and thinking errors, basic thinking errors. It doesn't eliminate all problems. It reduces their incidence, though. Um, we have a, a much lower incidence of problems with that. So although I've emphasized precision, Ultimately, the objective of this is to form an approach that allows you to get stuff right, that allows you to use your tests actively to the point where the idea of the tests and the idea in which you phrase your requirements, so even if you are not testing, I want to take this back to where I started, the big picture view of requirements, is the questions that you ask can be phrased in terms of this idea of a clear proposal about what something should do in a particular situation in an abstract way Back it up with a concrete example and see if there is also a supporting rationale, a softer rationale for what we are trying to do, a different kind of goal. Okay, I think it's time for the final coffee break. Thank you very much for your time.